We have finally reached the end of The Rings of Power with its eighth episode being the finale for season two. I'm going to give you a spoiler warning for this because I'm going to describe the episode as I usually do. And I'm just going to warn you, there's probably going to be a lot of heavy breathing and sighing as I go through this. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Airy. Welcome to the Studio Jake Vidcast, where I talk about all things pop culture. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and don't forget if you're watching on YouTube, to ring that little bell so you get notifications whenever I post a new vidcast and consider becoming a channel member. All right, so I'm going to dive right into the episode. We have the opening is Kazadun, where of course the dwarves are. Durin the Third received one of the rings of power for the dwarves, you know, five for the dwarven lords, and he has let greed and avarice overtake him. He is mining in an area where people are warning him, hey, don't dig there. There's a great evil asleep. And he's doing this. So his son, Durin the Fourth, his wife, Disa, and some of the other dwarves are looking for him, trying to find him. And he's in that deep tunnel. And he opens it up just as Durin is coming and is begging him to take off the ring. And they have another talk about their fifis. Oh my gosh, so much freaking talking in this show. But then the king reveals this huge mithril vein that is on the other side of the wall that he was trying to get through. However, the Balrog finally emerges and tries to climb up into the cavern so he can get to the other dwarves. This kind of snaps King Durin out of his stupor. He removes the ring and grabs his son's axe and basically says, you're, you're the king now, and jumps to fight the Balrog. During the fourth, tries to save his father, but then the other dwarves kind of hold him back, including Disa. And then Durin, or sh I should say King Durin, charges at the Balrog. They in exchange a few, a few blows, and then the tunnel collapses in on both of them, seemingly burying the Balrog, but also killing King Durin. I always say that I'm honest about my reviews. I just give my honest take on it. This was a cool sequence. This was really good. I really enjoyed seeing King Durin find redemption. I think it was earned. I think that if you go back and look at the Khazad-dûn arc, which is not that impressive, but up to this point, I think that the redemption of King Durin was earned. I wish that the rest of the show had been done with this because you can tell that they really put a lot of money into it. They hired good writers, at least to write this scene. And it was really cool. The Balrog was very well designed. And the scene where King Durin sacrifices himself to save his kingdom is a very impressive shot. So then we roll into the theme song. So we are now watching not Gandalf go into the not hobbits home. Now remember, Nori and Poppy have left their wandering band of not hobbits and have found a colony of not hobbits but then of course the dark wizards thugs have found them not gandalf the stranger as he's known in the show he comes down there the dark wizard is waiting for him and he says i'm not a dark wizard uh, people just say that about me because you know i wear these cool clothes or whatever so then his thugs come and they have nori and poppy held hostage which then the dark wizard proceeds to execute them to save nori and poppy he and the stranger have this exchange and the dark wizard is like hey stranger we should work together to stop sauron and replace him and the stranger's like i'm not replacing sauron i want to defeat him so then the dark wizard's all angry about this and he casts this spell and it causes the colony to collapse in on itself but then the stranger while he's not able to save like the buildings and whatnot he manages to save the not hobbits and then he's kind of shocked by the devastation that was caused so then we go to numenor where elindy's daughter is still working for the cousin king and she summons a bunch of the faithful who serve the queen regent mariel again who is not a character in the books and neither is elindy's daughter by the way and then the cousin because he looked in the plans here he saw that mariel had worked with halibrand who of course is sauron so he accuses her of this brings charges against her and starts arresting her men. But Elindy's daughter, she manages to buy enough time for Elindy to escape. And of course, Elindy is an idiot and he goes right to Queen Muriel and begs her to escape with him back to Middle-earth so that they can, you know, get an army together. 
she says she doesn't want to do this. She's fine with just being arrested by the cousin. And she gives him her sword. Because, of course, it can't just be his own epic sword. He has to get it from someone else. And she says, you will be the leader now. He leaves and she calls him the Lord of the Faithful. So then we go back to Eregion where the orcs are sieging the city and they manage to get the gate open and everything is looking very grim. We see Galadriel. Now remember in the previous episode, Celebrimbor gave Galadriel the nine rings and told her to flee. Guess what she's doing? She's not fleeing because she's a... You know, she's a girl boss and she can slay. Oh my gosh, just slay, clean. No man gonna tell her how to do strategy. So she escapes with, I say escapes in quotes, in air quotes, with a bunch of other elven women and children. So how come they're not girl bossing it like Gladriel? I guess she just gets that privilege. And remember, she knows Sauron is in this city, right? She knows he's there. She knows he wants the Nine Rings and the Elven Rings, but she's too busy, you know, doing more important things. And of course, she runs the hostages right into a trap. So much for girl bossing, am I right? So then we see that Sauron is torturing Celebrimbor because remember, he doesn't know Gladriel has the Nine Rings. They, again, have a conversation about their fifis. Oh my gosh, so much freaking talking in this show. So Celebrimbor does this prophecy thing where he says you will make a ring and it will be your undoing and even though you're the lord of the rings oh my gosh there was that wasn't a thing in the Cimmerillion, but whatever so this enrages sauron and he kills celebrimbor and then for some reason sauron cries remember this man is pure evil what does he have to cry about i can see him being frustrated and angry why is he crying come on what anyway so we go back to the southland and Isildur and Theo have a conversation and they talk about their fifis. Oh, my mommy. Hey, me, 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 me. I just hope Theo dies. He's a totally useless character. Again, he's not from the books. He's never made an appearance. He's an original character for the series. They couldn't have even bothered to give him a Middle Earth name. They had to name him Theo. Now he's talking with Isildur about his fifis. Oh, let's have a conversation about having a conversation about that conversation. So Theo leaves, thank goodness. Well, then the homeless chick. Now, remember, this girl betrayed Isildur twice, one point even stabbed him, and he has feelings for her, and she wants to leave her boyfriend and be with Isildur. Let me tell you something. This boyfriend did nothing wrong. He survived wild men. He survived orcs. He survived an attack by ints, and yeah, she's like, oh, I just want to leave him and be with you because, you know, whatever. They then cheat. So then Isildur kisses this homeless woman, They're cheating, effectively cheating on her boyfriend, who again does nothing wrong in the show. He's a totally innocent bystander. To everyone's shock and horror, the Numenorians come to retake the port and they're going to turn it into, you know, like a navy port basically. And they're saying, hey, you Southlanders, if you want to continue living here, you have to help with the lumber. Isildur gets into an exchange with the cousin king's son and he says he's going to go back to Numenor, and it's kind of implied that the homeless woman is going to make the right choice and stay with her boyfriend, right? And he finds out what's going on with the kingdom, basically. And then we cut to Galadriel, because remember, she led hostages into a trap, but they decided to let the hostages go because she agreed to help Adar. So they bring her to Adar, who's at a weird rock, and he's just kind of like has his head on it. She tells him, hey, I'll do your original deal. Remember, this original deal was just last episode. They could have done this, but no, it's redundant writing because they're creatively bankrupt. So then Adar stands up. He's wearing her ring because remember, he stole it from Elrond in the previous episode, and it's turned him back into an elf. It's healed him. He says, listen, let's just work together. I'll kill Sauron, and then I'll take the orcs back into Mordor, and I'll leave Eregion alone. And he gives her back the ring, and he immediately turns back into orc. Or, I'm sorry, a Uric. I didn't mean to misgender him. He's a Uric. A wounded orc comes, and he says, Father, because you know they've been calling Adar father for some dumb reason. He wants children, I guess. He's like, hey, I found Sauron. He tried to turn me against you, but it didn't work because you're, you're the boss. And he, then Adar walks up to him and says, we'll stop this before it's too late. But then that orc stabs him. And then Adar gets executed, mirroring how he had staged a coup against Sauron. 
where all these orcs are stabbing him to death. Sauron then appears and walks up to Morgoth's crown. And guess what Gladriel is doing this whole time? She's just staring agape at what is happening. I thought you were a girl boss. Start slaying, queen. Oh my gosh, why are you just standing there looking like an idiot? Sauron then orders the orcs to just lay waste to the city, to raise it to the ground, you know, have to throw in a Gandalf line in there. So then Gladriel, when she hears this, she finally snaps out of her stupor and picks up a sword and starts fighting back. But he is, of course, Sauron. He can snap his finger and kill her at an instant, but he doesn't do this. He decides to play with it and he demands the rings. And this sword fight, who coordinated this? A high school dance troupe coordinator? Ugh. Uh, slow motion swings, and it's not even an effect. It's like, oh my gosh. In Eregion, Elrond and the High King have been captured by the orcs. Erendir is somehow still alive, even though you plainly saw Ad Adar stab him in the previous episode, but somehow he's still alive. The That's the buzz cut elf, for those of you wondering. So then it cuts to Gladriel and Sauron. They're still fighting, and she gets the upper hand on him, but then he kind of distracts her by changing into different forms, including her. And he manages to injure her, but then she kicks him in a fit of rage and sends him flying. Again, this is Sauron, who's supposed to be one of the most powerful beings on Middle Earth, and she just kicks him and sends him flying. And he manages to fight back, but then she scratches his face, but then he stabs her with Morgoth's crown, and he manages to steal the Nine Rings. Then all of a sudden you hear a horn and it's the it's the horn of the dwarves they are coming in as that is happening Sauron tries to use a Jedi mind trick on Galadriel and he's saying help me heal middle earth of course he means conquer it but he keeps using this heal euphemism and she falls off a cliff and says the dumbest line ever you wish to heal middle earth kill yourself who wrote that did someone's 12 year old come in for bring your daughter to work day and they were like, hey, what's a great line we could put here? And she goes, you wish to heal Middle Earth, heal yourself. And then they wrote that down. Oh, my gosh. Of all the stupid lines that they could have written, anything would have been better. Heck, shouting a curse word as she fell would have been better than that. Oh, my God. Heal yourself. No, you. No, you. Uh, I'm a girl boss. No, you. Heal yourself. Uh, uh, I'm going to slay. So then the orc general who staged the coup against Adar, he comes to tell Sauron that the orcs are here and now they're overrun. I don't know how the dwarf army made it where they're overrun, but they are, I guess. Sauron kills that orc for his glory, I guess, and then orders a retreat, or it's implied that he orders a retreat. Erendir and the High Elf King, they find Galadriel, who I guess is apparently infected by Morgoth's crown, even though they never established that that was a thing in the books. Morgul Blades could do this. I guess it stands within reason that Morgoth's crown could do this. However, it would have been good that they established that it could do that early on. The King tries to heal Galadriel with the Elf Ring, but he can't do it. And then Elrond finally realizes that Gladriel was right the whole time. Of course he does. So then he puts on her ring and then they touch her to heal her. And we then get a montage where we see Nori and Poppy are helping the not Hobbit clan pack up. The dwarves are mourning the death of the king, King Durin. The elves look on as their city burns and they flee. The Numenorians are more fully taking over the port where the Southlanders live. And then the homeless woman who cheated on her boyfriend with Isildur is with her boyfriend now. And Isildur looks at them as the, as he drifts off into the sea. You see that Muriel is arrested by her cousin who is now on the throne. Elindy is in hiding. And then we see Sauron holding Celebrimbor's hammer. I guess that's a thing. We cut to where Nori and Poppy are and the Not Hobbits, they decide to leave their home because it's been destroyed by the Dark Wizard and they're calling the stranger Grand Elf. Oh my gosh, Grand Elf. As they say goodbye, they also kind of thank him for saving him. Nori then says goodbye to the stranger. She says, I'm going with them. This is where our journey goes, which I think is kind of stupid because in season one, they made such a big deal about how she was supposed to be with him, that it was her destiny. But Okay, fine, whatever. They go off, and as the stranger turns to leave, he finds a staff and brings it back 
to old Tom's house and they have another conversation about their feelings. He's like, this is just a test. You wanted me to pick friendship. And old Tom is like, well, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's a good way. You know, a wizard doesn't find his destiny. The destiny finds him. The staff finds him and his name finds him. Oh, and guess what? We found out not Gandalf. The stranger is actually Gandalf. Oh my gosh. What a plot twist. Who didn't see this? Come? Who knew? Who knew? Who didn't see this coming or who did see this coming? Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so, so touching. We finally get the reveal. The stranger is not Sarah and the stranger is not, you know, Radagast. The stranger is Gandalf. Oh, who, who knew? Oh my gosh. Who knew? Oh, I was so shocked. So then we see the dark wizard is looking out a window. We cut to during the fourth, who is trying to like establish himself as the new king. But he is told by one of the dwarf generals that his brother may try to make a play for the throne. I don't know why they are introducing another coup arc, because they've already done that with Numenor. But I guess they're going to establish that with the dwarves now. Gladriel wakes up, and she's in a grotto, and the High King, Elrond, and Buzzcut Elf are there. And they say that they found a place that they're using the elven rings to protect the elves, that it's safe from a shadow. And Elrond gives her the ring back. Then they have a long, boring conversation. What is with all the talking in this show? But they discuss what they're going to do about Sauron. The High King looks out over the elves that he had brought to Middle-earth, as well as the survivors of Eregion. And then everyone cheers, and that's how the show ends. Ends exactly how SJWs love these shows to end. Everyone cheers. Okay, so this show is terrible. Like I said, we have... One good scene where King Durin sacrifices himself to save the other dwarves from the Balrog. This was a terrible ending to a terrible show. It is not Tolkien. It is not Lord of the Rings. It is not the Cimmerillion. It is poorly written fan fiction by J.D. Payne and his little annoying sidekick. You can tell they did no research going to, into this. Hence why they didn't even bother to call it the Cimmerillion, which is what it should have been called. But no. They decided to cram two to 3,000 years of Middle-earth history into just a few months, I guess. And this is what they got, a maj paj of a bunch of story arcs. Most of them don't even have any impact to the story whatsoever. Like what Isildur was doing was but was Buzzcut Elf. That could have been completely written out. Nori and Poppy made no impact to this season whatsoever. Gandalf would have still been wandering. He still would have encountered the Dark Wizard. He still would have engaged with him. He still would have found his staff, and he would have found his name. We all know this. We didn't need Nori and Boppy to get him there. Quite frankly, Old Tom wasn't a necessary character to this season. What was his point? Again, Gandalf would have still done all these things without the guidance of Old Tom. And what is with all the talking? We don't need so much dialogue in this show. Show, don't tell. I, one of the things that really bothered me about the previous episode was there's a scene where the orcs caused a mountain to collapse so they could cross the river to Eregion. And then one of the elves literally just says, they're trying to dam the river. Yes, I know that. I can see that. I'm not an idiot. I can see that that is the thing that is happening on the screen. But they're so creatively bankrupt. But at the same time, they think they're better than their own audience. So they think they need to handhold you while at the same time, they're not creative enough to write things symbolically or metaphorically, so they just have to cram a whole bunch of dialogue and monologuing into this thing to make it make sense, because that's the only way it comes together. People were saying, oh, they humbled Gladriel in this season. I don't see that at all. They just gave Elrond a bigger chance to be a hero. She's still self-righteous. She's still annoying. She is still arrogant, and she's still a girl boss. She's exactly the same not Galadriel character. I've heard Nerdrotic, I think, call her Galadriel. That is a perfect description of her. She's just a slay. Oh my gosh, I'm going to go out there and slay. You can tell these people know nothing about Lord of the Rings. I hope that this series gets canceled. And I hate to say that because of all the people who put time and effort into this, all the people not named J.D. Payne, not named the celebrities involved in this series, they all did what they could with the materials given. But this show is an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to Tolkien. It's an embarrassment to Middle Earth. And it's an embarrassment to Tolkien's fans all around the world. It is not Lord of the Rings. It is not the Cimmerillion. I have actually read these things. Structurally, it's all over the map. 
they're following at least five different story arcs with a bunch of characters that are unnecessary. And why try to humanize the orcs? They're evil. They're dark. They're there to destroy. They are a corruption of the elves. The elves are meant to be basically like angels who are there to be wise and to guide Middle Earth into wisdom. The orcs are traitors to the elves. They're corrupted. They're evil. They've given into greed and to bloodlust. But no, we've got to humanize them because orcs' lives matter, I guess. It was so ridiculous and silly and written with all the gusto of a fan fiction writer on Tumblr, not even in the good places like Wattpad and fanfiction.net like Tumblr. It's an embarrassment. And listen, if you're a fan of the show, fine, watch it. You're free to disagree with me, even though I'm objectively correct, but whatever. Listen to everyone else who agrees with me, who have read the books or seen Peter Jackson's masterpiece trilogy. Do not let fans of this show gaslight you. Do not let them. This is not a good adaption of Tolkien's works, and it's not even a good show. It may have been passable if it wasn't been Lord of the Rings, but the point is, it's not. They didn't just make some original fantasy series where they could have a girl boss elf kicking butt and taking names. They didn't do that. Instead, they decided to adapt Tolkien's masterpiece, The Silmarillion. And it is okay for you to say, hey, this isn't a good show, and hey, it's not a good adaption of Tolkien's work. Do not let people on the internet or in real life gaslight you, because that's all it is. Now, they're free to like it and respect their opinion of it, but you do not have to fall for it. I'm just so sad that modern audiences, this is what they think Tolkien's work is, a mismatch of arrogant, selfish people that are trying to look heroic when they are not heroic. If you like that video, be sure to give it a like, share it out to all your friends, and also leave me a comment on what you think. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, ring that little bell so you get notifications when I post a new vidcast and consider becoming a channel member. If you don't wanna support me on Big Tech, click on the link to my Locals community. It's in the description. It's kind of like a Patreon or subscribe star where you can send me tips. You can also become a monthly subscriber. Also consider purchasing one or all of my books and leave me a five-star review whenever you do. It really helps out small indie creators like myself. Once again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time right here on Studio Jake. Cause I've been living life right like I could just die.